So tonight's talk, as you know, is Planet Earth, Who's Got the Maintenance Manual by James Curran, who at the moment is visiting professor at Stirling University. Strathclyde. Strathclyde, sorry. <laughs> I keep doing that. He's been around a few. <laughs> um, I don't think there's many people in Scotland who are actually better placed to talk about this subject than James, because he has a very long history of career in environmental science. He started off designing and installing a, a weather station up the top of Cairngorm, sort of following in the footsteps of William Spears Bruce, I think, although he didn't go to the Antarctic. Um, but he sat on many committees, he's worked for government, he's worked for agencies, he's been a uh, chief of Chief Executive of SEPA, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. Retired from there in 2015, but has been very busy working for various groups, Scottish um, Sustainability Forum, and commenting on COP reports for I and IPCC reports for Scottish Government and I think UK Government. So he's well up on all things climate change. So you don't want to hear me, you want to hear him, so I will now hand over to James. So please welcome James Cameron. Thank you very much, Claire, for that introduction, and, and what a great turnout this evening. Thank you all so very much for, for coming along. I hope I will certainly try to make it worth your while. Um, the Souter Theatre, now, because I'm you know, a bit of a philistine. I honestly hadn't heard of Willie Souter, so I looked him up, and uh, I found that little verse of his, which probably you all know off by heart. But do take a moment to read it, because it gives a little hint about at least some of what this evening's talk will be about. I'm largely going to be talking about climate change, obviously. I think that, that was maybe given away in, in, in the title and so on. And we know that climate change is all about trying to hit net zero. And there's a little Scottish story to net zero as well, because net zero, the, the term and the concept, was actually uh, cooked up in the back kitchen of Glen House near Peebles. Um, there were one or two famous people there, um, but uh, the main one uh, who, who's attributed with thinking up the concept of net zero in order to make everything about climate change just a little bit simpler to understand is Tessa Tennant. Um, and Tessa Tennant it was a, she's dead recently, was a absolutely groundbreaking green finance operator. Mm. And that is the second little hint about what uh, I hope we'll be talking about this evening. Anyway, I mean, this is a, a, another hero of mine, uh, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, and this quote is more or less attributable to him. Uh, the trouble with Planet Earth is that it didn't come with an instruction manual. Um, you know, you can't kind of bang it on the side like a faulty TV or switch it off and back on again like a computer. Uh, so how are we actually going to manage a failing faulty planet? Well, I think we do actually have uh, a, a, an operating manual or an instruction manual, if you like. And uh, it's called sustainable development. And despite the concept of sustainability, which was first introduced globally by the Brundtland Report in 1987, honestly, we have not been doing well on sustainability ever since then and before. And this is just an example of that. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, nearly everything we do in the world is increasing year on year. So there's uh, trade as the top one going up. GDP going up, uh, CO2 emissions, yes, going up, uh, and agriculture production also going up. And on the left-hand side is the amount of space every one of us on the planet has available to us as an individual, and with rising population, that available land to every single one of us becomes less and less. One of the results of that, of course, is uh, climate change. And this 
graph is taken from a report that just came out in the last week, actually, which has uh, shown that the average global temperature last year, global temperature was plus 1.45 degrees <coughs> centigrade. Now that might scare you because we all know that the COP in Paris, the Paris Agreement, was to aim to keep global temperature ideally to plus 1.5, but certainly below 2 degrees centigrade. Now, that, this figure doesn't mean to say that we've broken that yet, because that plus 1.5 from Paris is based on a 10-year average. So we haven't had that yet, but we've had one year that is so close to 1.5, and there's now, as it says, there are 66% chance that over the next four years we will break plus 1.5 degrees centigrade. And in fact, if we go on as the way we are at the moment, we've only got six years left before we break the 1.5 boundary. And you know, we're all in it together. There's not a single one of us can kind of abrogate our responsibility for this. This just indicates that, okay, China is now the biggest emitter of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, the United States, significantly less. But the point I wanted to make was the rest of the world, and that includes the UK and Scotland, those smaller emitters, and the UK is now about 1.7% of the total global emission. If we just say, well, we're too small to bother about, then the whole of that blue box doesn't get attended to. So every single country on the planet, every single one of us, I would contend, has a degree of responsibility. But some people have more responsibility than others because it's a very, very unequal distribution of uh, causation, if you like. You can see here that there's a geographical inequality. Uh, the United States, uh, is a big emitter, European Union a big emitter, China a big emitter, India really very low. But also on this plot it shows you that the rich emit far, far more than the poor. And, uh, you know, it seems to me the wealthy everywhere really must do more. So just a quick run through of, you know, things that you'll all be aware of, I'm sure. Um, this is the melting of the permafrost on the north slope of Alaska, and there's, it's now reckoned that nearly every uh, village in Alaska is going to collapse into the subsoil, and everyone will have to be moved, and the towns are rebuilt. This is a major wildfire in the Yukon Delta, again in Alaska, as far north as that. Um, the problem with this, for example, is that is not only releasing large amounts of carbon dioxide itself, but there's a lot of smoke. And where is that smoke going? That smoke ends up, some of it anyway, on the ice sheets of Greenland. And that smoke not only makes the ice dark, there's a problem with that, but it provides nutrients for cyanobacteria to grow on, and they turn the ice dark as well. So the albedo, that's the reflectivity of that ice sheet in Greenland, in some places now has dropped from 70% being reflected to 20%. So when the sun shines, the ice melts even faster. This is a methane blowhole or crater in Siberia. That's actually 50 meters across. And that's happening because, again, the permafrost is melting and the trapped methane underneath the ice explodes out. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, at least 25 times worse than carbon dioxide. Not a good sign that that's beginning to happen. And back here in Scotland, uh, closer to home, this is the Monoliath Mountains, just along Speyside, between Speyside and kind of uh, Great Glen. Um, and you can immediately tell something not very healthy about that. It's reckoned that probably 5% of peak cover in Scotland is eroding. And you might think, why? Well, some of it definitely attributable to overgrazing and deer and sheep and, you know, maybe even people tramping and paths and so on. But if you think about peat, peat is created in a cold, wet climate. And our climate is 
not as cold as it was. It's actually drier in summer and wetter in winter. So if the peat dries out in the summer, when there's a bit of drought and it's warmer temperatures, it loses moisture, the peat shrinks and cracks, and then you get the heavy rain in the winter and it washes the peat away. That's not a good thing because peat is a huge holder of carbon and when it erodes it turns back into carbon dioxide. Um, Scotland's peat bogs hold, let me just look up this number so I don't get it wrong. Six billion tons of carbon, which is the equivalent of six billion tons of carbon dioxide. That is a lot of carbon dioxide. Now, healthy peat extracts carbon out of the atmosphere and locks it up in the peat deposits. Peat that is eroding like that releases it back into the atmosphere. And it's reckoned if about one half of one percent of Scotland's peat cover erodes each year. That is the equivalent of all Scotland's man-made emissions. So this is a big, big effect. And it's an effect that is positive feedback. It's climate change producing a change in the environment which contributes to worsening climate change itself. Positive feedback, feeding on itself, making the situation worse. Potentially very dangerous. Okay, so, I mean, you know, I, I assume most of you in the audience anyway kind of know all that stuff and believe all that stuff and the message is most definitely uh, spreading more widely. This is another report that's just come out about a week ago from the World Economic Forum. They do a global risks uh, report every single year. This is the most recent. Five of the ten top risks globally are environment related. And the top four are all climate related and closely interrelated, as we'll see a little bit later on. So let's just try and think about mankind and nature over the millennia. If you go back a long, long, long time in history, we as humankind faced a pretty hostile environment. You know, we, we, we were surrounded by threats from the world we lived in. That could have been diseases and illness, epidemics, storms, floods, drought, extreme heat and cold, poor foraging, <coughs> starvation. It's not surprising that humankind wanted to control the environment. And we became very good at it. And then about a hundred years ago or so, the kind of penny dropped that you know, maybe we ought to put in some regulation and a few laws and controls and so on because we were damaging the environment so much. So we've had about a century of regulatory control by organizations like the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and similar organizations all around the world. So we moved from protecting people from our environment to protecting the environment from us, the people. It's only very recently, I think, we've begun to think that it's the environment that protects us. We actually depend fundamentally <coughs> and intrinsically on a healthy environment. So we were talking earlier about sustainable development and in the top left hand corner there you'll see the traditional model of sustainable development which I'm sure you'll all have seen. These three intersecting circles of the economy, society and the environment. And that small overlap in the middle is meant to be sustainable development, where you do good for each of them. I hate that model. I absolutely hate it. Because it immediately kind of puts you in a, in a, a place of mind that you can have trade-offs. You know, okay, we do two of them. We damage the environment. But so what? We've got social benefit and economic benefit. You know, that idea of trade-offs, I despise. And that mind model of sustainable development kind of encourages that way of thinking. The model I much prefer is the, the big one. And in that, the underlying component is environment. On top of that is society, and on top of that is the economy. 
The economy is a, is, is a social construct. It's there to serve our needs. You can't have a healthy economy without a healthy society. And you can't have a healthy society without a healthy environment. To me, that seems a much better model of what I believe sustainable development would be. It doesn't allow you to think of trade-offs. What it forces you to think of is multiple benefits. Whatever we do must improve the economy, society, and environment. So what is this kind of environment or nature that I'm talking about that, that underpins, that I contend anyway, society and the economy? Well, you can explain it using the concept of ecosystem services. These are the services provided by nature to humankind for free. And then normally marshaled under these kind of four headings. Provisioning, and I'll leave you to read the boxes, uh, regulating, cultural, and supporting. Okay, uh, and they can be valued. You know, economists have done that, environmental economists have done that. And globally, the value has been estimated, probably an underestimate, at 350, what is that? <laughs> trillion, that's right, my mind went black. Trillion dollars per year, four and a half times global GDP. So these free services are pretty valuable. And we're destroying them, we're trashing them. But they can be recovered. And the little picture at the bottom there is actually from Rana Kumar. And what's interesting about that is that a fence was built around a small part of Ranagmore, which was left alone, not overgrazed by sheep and deer, and it recovers. That's what Scotland should look like, not the desolation that surrounds it. So the ecosystems and the services that they provide can be recovered, and we've got to remember that and remain positive. <laughs> that we can do that as rapidly as possible. But, and there's always a but, there was a national ecosystem assessment done across the whole of the UK in 2011, okay, a little bit a while ago now, and I've drawn out here the Scottish component, and I think you can see that the red and the amber are those ecosystem services, again, and in this case there's just three, provisioning, cultural and regulating against certain kind of habitats. And you can see that it's a pretty bleak picture. In fact, 44% of ecosystem services in Scotland are declining. By definition, that is so unsustainable. We can look at it another way, of course. And this, again, has only come out in about the last month or two. Uh, a recent plot from the Stockholm University Resilience Institute, and this is about planetary boundaries. So this is experts trying to judge what planetary boundaries have we already transgressed. Now, by a planetary boundary, I think we all know that we can disturb the environment to a certain extent. It's that difference between contamination and pollution. Contamination you know, it, it's measurable in the environment, but it's not harming it. If you get into pollution, then it's harming it. This is breaking planetary boundaries, and particularly irreversibly, then you get into the red zone. If you're in the green zone, you're okay. And I think we can see here that we've uh, already well broken the planetary <coughs> limits for climate change, land management, biodiversity, and the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle. That's the N and the P at the bottom there. But referring back to something I hinted at earlier, all of these are interrelated. Just take one little example. Climate change quite obviously impacts on biodiversity. It affects wildlife. Emissions of nitrogen create eutrophication, which damages biodiversity. Some nitrogen emissions are very powerful greenhouse gases themselves and make climate change worse. Biodiversity and healthy ecosystems sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, as we saw in the case of healthy peat. 
and counteract climate change. So, you know, we're dealing here with a very complex, interacting world, creating so-called wicked problems. And wicked problems need systems solutions. Wicked problems need wicked solutions. Let's just move on to a little bit more directly uh, climate change and carbon emissions. The carbon cycle for the planet is in itself very complex and very interrelated. And I don't expect you to look at this particular diagram, but the, the human perturbation on the fluxes of carbon dioxide across the planet is tiny. You can see it's, it's there. It's that red number nine in the middle, fossil fuels, making cement and so on. All of these release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Look at them in, in contrast to the size of the natural fluxes. You know, there's 90 coming out of the oceans. There's 60 coming out of the land. These are huge natural fluxes of carbon dioxide right across the planet. But we've disturbed it. And the amount we put in seems to be tiny, and about one third of it is absorbed back into plants and animals, back into the likes of the peatlands. About a quarter goes into the ocean, where it causes damage because it makes the ocean acidic, which is very bad for marine life. And only 44%, as it says at the top there, stays in the atmosphere. So we're actually injecting a relatively small amount, and only half of it stays in the atmosphere. But we've been doing it for decades, and it accumulates in the atmosphere and begins to cause heating and warming and all the associated uh, climate change effects and resultant environmental and ecological impacts. I just want to kind of indulge myself very briefly because, uh, as Claire said, I retired from CEPA in 2015. And when I retired, I was desperate to get back to doing some real science rather than you know, running what, what is, was a fantastic organization. And what I wanted to do was to look at this. This is the so-called Keeling curve. Since 1960, uh, fantastically pre precise measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have been taken on the peak of Mauna Loa, which is a volcano on Hawaii. So it's right on the equator, right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, very high up in the atmosphere because it's on top of a very high mountain. You couldn't find a better place to try and measure kind of background planetary carbon dioxide levels. And that's been done continuously since 1960. And this is the so-called Keeling curve, which is <laughs> obviously going in the wrong direction, up and steeper and steeper. But what I found fascinating is that it's not just a continuous line, it's this sawtoothed line. <coughs> what is that? You know, it's really interesting that that drop here is because the northern hemisphere has its summer. And the northern hemisphere, plants and vegetation and crops and so on put on leaves. Those absorb carbon dioxide out of, out of the atmosphere. You pick it up in the middle of the Pacific Ocean because the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere drop. Come the northern hemisphere winter, all the leaves fall off and they biodegrade and they put carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So it goes up, but it goes up further because we've added the human bit as well. What it struck me is that that drop is a direct measure of the health of the northern hemisphere environment, nature in the northern hemisphere. What's happened? It was doing well up until about the year 2000. It was absorbing more carbon dioxide year by year because of what has always been assumed to be the fertilization process. Carbon dioxide is a fertilizer. Plants need it. If they have more up to a certain limit, they grow better. From 2000 onwards, it's not doing so well, is it? Because of all the climate <coughs> effects, extreme drought, wildfires, storms, tree throw, water, floods, whatever, saturation of the ground. 
So nature is beginning to lose its ability to absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. How big is that effect? It's huge. Because if it had gone on improving the way it was in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, it would have followed that green line, is it? Upwards. It hasn't. It's tailed off, possibly beginning to go down. That difference is a bunch of emissions the size of China again. So, you know, this, this is potentially very serious. It's one of those environmental tipping points that we really don't want to go anywhere near, some of which could possibly be irreversible. We can look at that in other ways, of course. Uh, the, this is a couple of plots of biodiversity. The first one from the UK, and the second one global. Uh, for the UK, that is uh, the relative abundance of 224 priority species um, measured across the timeline 1970 to 2019. That's dropped by 40% almost. Biodiversity in the UK is in trouble. Globally, that is an amazing load of surveys put together. That's 32,000 populations of 5,200 species monitored right around the planet between 1970 and 2018. That's dropped 70%. It's not good news, is it? I mean, uh, nature is in retreat. And as I suggested earlier on, nature is fundamental to our lives and our lifestyle. The global extinction rate is estimated now, extinction rate of plants and animals, to be 1,000 times higher than would be normal due to all of these pressures and impacts. So, we've got to do an awful lot more. And uh, the world Economic Forum, suggesting that all its top global risks are climate related. They've also done analysis of how we can actually <coughs> counteract that. And there's a growing belief that the only way we can actually mobilize the cost, the amount of money, the amount of investment it's going to take to reverse these trend trends is to get the private sector involved. And there's some figures here, I don't expect you to look at all of them, you don't need to, but uh, there's $200 trillion of available private investment in the world. It hugely exceeds the amount of public investment available. And we've really got to shift that to start doing good in the planet rather than doing harm. And carbon offsetting is one way that will do that. Um, but there may be many others, and indeed one of the jobs I had after retiring uh, was I was on the board of what was called the Green Purposes Company, which was set up by the UK Parliament to oversee the UK Green Investment Bank when it was privatised, because Parliament was worried that the Green Investment Bank might give up on its green mission. It was bought by Macquarie Bank, a global bank from Australia, which didn't then have the greatest record on ethical investment. So we kind of, I'm not on it anymore, but for six years I was on that, doing that very interesting job of overseeing a huge global investor and ensuring that it stuck to its green <coughs> mission, which they did. They were really, really good. And actually began to influence the much bigger Macquarie Bank as well. So, it, you know, there's a lot of criticism for that privatization, but probably it actually did good globally. But, you know, it's, it's hard to shift big institutions like that in their thinking about where and how and when they should be making the profits that, that they have to. There's a kind of rule of ten that I often quote here. Roughly a hundred billion dollars a, a year is needed to restore nature globally. That's an estimate that has been you know, banded about. About 10 billion is actually being invested. And of that, 1 billion comes from the private sector. 
and yet the private sector has vastly more resources than the public sector. So how do we shift that? Well, the voluntary carbon market is one market that is working, and it's you know pretty active in Scotland. This is something I pulled off just the other day as well. Uh, I think it's probably well known to everyone in here that there's concern that land values in Scotland, particularly large estates, are going through the roof. And here's the figures to prove it, if you look here. Over the last couple of years, the price paid for, per hectare of estate land in Scotland has gone up by about a factor four. That's because there's big money to be made planting trees and getting the carbon credits. The UK government provides you funding and gives you an income based on how much carbon your trees are pulling out of the environment. Uh, so it's certainly a good investment but I think there are real concerns about whether it's doing act actually the optimum job for nature, for the environment, and also for the local communities. And I think there's growing evidence that the answer to that is no, it's not. Going back to COP26 in Glasgow a couple of years ago now, there was a huge surge then looking at trying to mobilize private money to, 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 to support the regeneration of ecosystem services and the protection of nature worldwide. Mark Carney led that move and uh, created the GFANS, uh, as it's called, which was a group of financial investors from around the world with assets worth $130 trillion. But those are assets, remember. It's not free cash. They're not going to move it that quickly. But all of them signed up to start this movement towards mobilizing private investment. And another interesting discussion that came up first at Glasgow was this idea of carbon border adjustments. And actually, the EU has just agreed to start imposing carbon border adjustments. And the UK and Scotland, therefore, will inevitably have to follow, even though we're not in the EU anymore. Uh, if we don't kind of follow them and mirror their environmental standards, then they'll cut us out of any kind of market dealing with Europe at all. Um, carbon border adjustments, what's that about? Well, it's a border tax on goods coming into Europe that do not take account of their embedded carbon. And it's not every good at the moment. It's things like steel and aluminium and concrete and so on. Things that have big amounts of embedded carbon. You know, a lot of carbon has been released manufacturing them. When they come into Europe, if the country of origin doesn't have a carbon trading agreement like Europe does and like the UK does, UK now has its own, then they will pay the difference at least, at least the difference, maybe more, at Europe's border in order to get a level playing field. So you're beginning to see that no economy in the world ultimately can be anything but a green economy. This is really good regulation beginning to make a real difference. Okay, at COP15, less heard about, but it's the biodiversity equivalent of all of these COPs that we know about that are the climate change ones. And it was a year ago COP15 took place in Canada. And uh, in advance of that meeting, the World Trade Organization, not a known green organization in particular, <laughs> announced that 55% of global, global GDP depends on healthy ecosystems. So, you know, there's, there's an absolute priority for those investing in the world economy to make sure that these ecosystem services are sustained so that the economy is sustained. And COP15 uh, had many headlines that emerged back in December 2022. The, the, the one that was most heard about was 30 by 30. 30% 30 of the planet's marine and land areas to be given some sort of statutory protection by 2030. 
we're quite a long way off that at the moment, but that's a commitment that was made. But also, there was a lot of talk about mobilizing money, and in particular, at least $200 billion per year from public and private sources for biodiversity-related funding. So big money, again, was getting mentioned. And things are moving, but glacially slowly. It's important to invest now and to invest large amounts and very urgently. Again, I don't expect you to read everything that's on this slide, but you'll see UK CCC, UK Climate Change Committee, uh, from about a year ago has been announcing that by their calculations, uh, you now get a positive return on investing in the UK to drive down emissions. Remember there used to be all this talk about, oh, it's far too expensive, we can't possibly do that. Well, no longer. <laughs> the best economic forecasts are that you will actually get a 2% return, return, positive return on GDP by 2050 if we invest now. The longer you leave it, the more it will cost, the more damage will be done, and the less you'll get back. So, it seems as though private investment in so-called nature-based solutions can work, will work. And again, when I was on the uh, Green Purposes Company overseeing the Green Investment Bank, we commissioned a study worldwide of private investment in nature-based solutions. And it is happening. And it does work. And investors make a real return on their investment. It may not be the biggest, but it's there and it's safe and it's, it's dependable and you can forecast it. But what does it need? Why isn't it happening? I think it's because it does generally need a bit of public finance to underpin it, uh, to, 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 to give that surety that nothing's going to go wrong. So it's a public and private joint financing initiative or the public at least de-risking the private investment but it also needs stacking up of income generation. So you might invest in a particular piece of land. You're only going to make a profit if you get a produce out of it. That may be agricultural. It may be agroforestry. So it may be timber products. It may be a reduction in pollution of water which is then being drawn off for a potable supply or something, so it reduces the cost of the drinking water treatment uh, in the plant, or it could be reducing flood risk downstream. All of these can be monetized, and if you stack them up, you get a decent return on your investment. But who's going to do that? You can bet that the likes of the Green Investment Bank won't go out and seek those sorts of opportunities and put them together. What's needed is an honest intermediary, an honest broker. And I would suggest there is a real role if they would be prepared to do it for green NGOs and other community-based voluntary organizations to do that kind of aggregation and give an imprimatur on that investment opportunity that this is the best. It's got very good environmental credentials and it's got very good community credentials. That's a piece of work that needs to be done and the investors themselves will not do it. So, let's come back to Scotland uh, where, you know, we've done pretty well on reducing our own territorial emissions. Uh, as you can see in the top right there, uh, they're down by about 50%. I think just over 50% now. Pretty good, but, again, there's always a but. What about the things we import? And that's the bigger graph on the left. Everything we import, as I was mentioning with respect to the EU border taxes and so on, has carbon embedded in it. And as a country, we import a lot. Uh, we import roughly the same amount from the rest of the UK as we do internationally. You add those together, and the carbon embedded in all those products is very nearly double our own emissions and have reduced by less 
than we've reduced our own emissions. Somehow or other we've got to get a grip on that. And uh, this is all about the, the, the amount of material we extract from the planet. Here's a comparison, because again, we always hear, ah, you know, all of these rare earth metals and so on, we need to create wind generators, the planet's going to run out of them, blah, blah, blah. What about batteries using all that lithium? Uh, yeah, I mean, these are issues that you can't just ignore. But this compares the amount of resources you need to extract from the planet over a year to generate the same amount of energy as you do if you extract oil, gas, and coal. I mean, there's a world of difference there. The amount of material going into renewable energy, and that's all this plot is about, is tiny <coughs> in comparison to our traditional methods of generating <coughs> energy. And I think it may have been on an earlier slide, but I didn't mention it. It's often quoted that 90% of global biodiversity loss is driven by extraction and subsequent processing of raw materials. So it's really important we drive down that extraction of materials from the planet. How do we do that? Well, again, we have the answer, the circular economy. I happen to be uh, a, a bit obsessed with the circular economy. Uh, I'm sure you all know roughly what it's about. It's a, about a redesigning of our economy. So every good that we produce is produced as much as possible from reused and recycled materials, but it's designed as well to last as long as possible, get away from this throwaway society we have. So the, 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 the piece of equipment can be disassembled, it can be upgraded, you can put a new chip in it, you can, you, you, you can modify it and improve it without having to throw it away and buy a new one. It's about leasing goods rather than buying them. A thing we all used to do. We used to have hire TVs and hire washing machines and so on. The great thing about that is it's in the it's in the supplier's interest that it lasts a long time, rather than him having to come out and mend it. And there is now uh, in France, and I think it's coming in Europe, a, a, a legal right to repair. Every piece of equipment you buy must be repairable. For at least seven years. Fantastic. Yeah, this is the way we can shift towards the circular e economy, which intrinsically must be based on renewable energy, of course, but then builds in all these elements about leasing, reuse, modifying, upgrading, and it's only at the, the very worst option is to recycle. So it goes way beyond recycling. <coughs> A uh, very recent study, again, just came out in the last week from Deloitte, suggests that only 7% of the global economy and the UK economy approaches anything like circularity, 7%. But if the world did adopt a circular economy, it would drive down climate change emissions by over 40%. So this is definitely worth going for. and it'll make money, and it'll create jobs, and it'll create more national resilience because you're less dependent on uh, the global economy and globalization. Just one example which I usually give at this point because it's a company I love, admire, I've got nothing to do with it, but for a, a, a time uh, my wife and I ran a, an eco store in the center of Glasgow. Um, one of the things we stopped there, for shorthand we called it the John Lewis of the environment. We tried to stop everything that John Lewis had in a space about the size of this room. Um, and we did. We stopped a very wide range of, 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 of items, but we would only stop one that we, we <laughs> professionally, judged to be environmentally the best. And one of the ones I loved was carpet tiles. Uh, made by a company called Interface, which is a global company, over a billion turnover, big, successful company, uh, founded and run by uh, an amazing man, Ray Anderson, and it, it, it demonstrates the power of leadership, because 
way back in the 1950s, he dared to imagine that he could create a company that did no harm to the environment. And by 2020, they'd achieved that. He dared to imagine. And if you think about the carpet tile itself, what a fantastic sustainable design. <coughs> Not here, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but you put a new fitted carpet in your front room that night, you spill a glass of red wine in the middle of the floor. You've maybe damaged 0.01% of the carpet, but you have to take the whole carpet up. 55% of carpets in the UK still go straight to landfill. Crazy. Carpet tiles, you just replace that one tile. You can put the other one in a washing machine. But what that company did was they made them entirely out of recycled materials. They were carbon zero. And they offered a service only to commercial customers, unfortunately, not to the public yet, of a leasing deal. You don't buy your carpeting, you just lease it off them. So they come in and keep it up to date, modernize it, and look after it. The very model of the circular economy. He's dead now, unfortunately, but his successors continue to dare to imagine, and they've now uh, created this concept of the forest factory. Hence the picture I very proudly <laughs> made myself. The forest factory puts more back into nature than it takes out. Sounds fantastic, doesn't it? But currently, only 1% of investment in the UK is going into the circular economy. So what, what could happen here? Um, yeah, I think there's an opportunity in Perthshire perhaps uh, to address the circular economy by applying it to the agri-food system. And I'm not going to go through any of this in detail, but it could be worth considering creating a cluster around the agri-food and sector across to shift towards a circular business model. Um, the expertise, I'm sure, is here. Uh, the sustainability credentials can be developed. Government can support with consistent, strong policy and some grant awarding. Um, it would need a culture shift to form more cooperatives, to do more direct marketing of agricultural produce, to share equipment, and to adopt all of these techniques here. Uh, companion planting, zero-till, agrivoltaics, agroforestry. We know how to do them all. We've got fantastic expertise here in Scotland. I think that could work, and it would create more jobs and more local value in Russia. The private sector could provide the capital investment. So that's the end of all I'm going to say. These are the guys that need to study, learn, and use the Earth's operating manual. That's my belief, anyway. Thank you very much. I've written more notes than I did an undergraduate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I won't keep everybody long. I, I, a couple of things that struck me were, one, when I was doing my research in the, in the <coughs> 1980s, it was 335 ppm. And, and the last talk that you gave me in 2011, it was about 290. For every year that my children have gone through their teenage years, it's put on virtually an extra ppm, which when you think about it, it's a bit scary. Um, and you, you did scare us a wee bit, I think, um, uh, giving us this scenario uh, and that graph I was talking about, about that, the tipping points, which you hinted at, but didn't go too far into, but fortunately. However, um, I think what you did do was, was also give some possible solutions. It wasn't all hand-wringing, and as, as private Fraser would say, we're doomed. <laughs> you know, it wasn't all about that. So... Uh, and for me, that it, it was, I've got down here underlined, I'm really privileged because it was so informed and measured, uh, but candid, a message, uh, and, and as I say, more optimistic than private Fraser, and perhaps leaving, relieving some of our uh, climate anxiety, which is the latest thing I have in the student. Um, so, so I can't thank you. Thank you very much. It's very learned, and we're very privileged to have uh, Professor Curry give us our talk tonight. Thank you very much.